Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind überall, von Lithuania bis zum Sahel, von Afghanistan bis zum Irak bis zum Libanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. I'm your host, Olga Oliker. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope. Here in the studio with us, uh, Hugh and I have two of our colleagues, uh, Giuseppe Fama, the head of our EU Affairs Unit, and Lisa Michel, our Senior Analyst for EU Advocacy and Research. We've picked an opportune time to talk to them because as of December 1st, the European Union has a new chief diplomat. Josep Borrell of Spain has taken over from Federico Mogherini as the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. And he's doing it at a very interesting time. But before we get to that, Giuseppe, can you tell us a little bit about what Borrell's job actually is? Of course. Josep Borrell has just uh, started his mandate uh, as chief uh, EU diplomat, which is very much like being a multi-headed hydra. Uh, <laughs> on, on the one hand, he is the chief diplomat who is chairing all the 28 ministers of foreign affairs in the council, in the foreign affairs council. Then he is also the head of the commission service, which manages uh, foreign policy instruments for the commission and also chairs all commissioners which are in charge of the external relations and foreign policy tools of the European Union uh, to some extent. And most notably, he is also the head of the European uh, Union Diplomatic Service, the European External Action Service. There is also a third hat, which is that of being the chief executive of the European Defence Agency, where, uh, although this competence has been uh, redistributed a little bit in the Commission. It's absolutely not an easy job, a job which is very much subject to different understandings and interpretations, sometimes even from member states, who ask more or less to the high representative according to the specific interests that they have at stake. So Josep Borrell will certainly have five years of intense engagement to try to shepherd and, and keep European diplomacy uh, on track on the many rising crisis that we have. So I'm going to ask you to clarify that a little bit. Uh, what do you mean that different uh, member states have different expectations of him? Just talk us through that a little bit. Maybe you have some examples. Yes, this is uh, a reflection which we've been developing very much recently also on the basis of the talks and exchanges that we had with several European diplomats in town here in Brussels. It stems from the fact that the foreign affairs setting, the institutional setting of the European Union, foresees the high representative, so uh, Borrell, as being basically mandated by the 28 member states, ambass- well, now 27 after Brexit, mm-hmm. uh, ambassadors in, in the Political and Security Committee. So some see the role of the high representative very much being guided by the member states in particular, acting like a sort of secretary general, like in the UN setting, for instance, whereas there are other interpretations, and this is also part of an internal divergence of views within the European Union, whether uh, the high representative, and Josep Borrell in this case, will uh, has enough political autonomy and decision-making powers to steer many of the processes and decisions uh, in the European Union. This is triggering fears to some that EU would result becoming a further, a 28th now, member states having its own position and therefore changing the balance at times uh, of the EU because of its privileged position in the decision-making process. But overall, this is also very much um, a position which has been in the making only for free mandates, and therefore it's normal to have this kind of debate uh, among its own stakeholders. So, Lisa, what does uh, Josep Borrell himself bring uh, to this job? Who is he? So Josep Borrell is a former Spanish uh, diplomat, um, or he is a Spanish diplomat actually, but former foreign minister of Spain. Just before starting his job as a high representative, he was foreign minister. So he was sitting in the Foreign Affairs Council with all the other EU foreign ministers already. So he's seen the work from that side of a member state perspective. So what is interesting now is that now he is sort of the voice of the EU as a whole and needs to try to forge a joint position among the member states. So he has kind of changed his role, uh, but has a lot of experience uh, from the member states side. And he's very famous for being someone who's very outspoken, who really talks his mind and doesn't really necessarily always use very diplomatic language. So it would be interesting to see now how, how he will handle that, because of course in the EU he's speaking for 28 member states on 27 soon. But uh, yeah, we're very interesting to see how he will handle the crisis and the conflicts that he has to work on now. 
So Crisis Group has uh, recently identified seven priorities for Burrell as he takes office. And you can read our special briefing on that topic. Uh, It's available on our website. But I wanted to talk about this because, uh, well, Giuseppe and Lisa lead the team that put this together. And I want to go through them one by one. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit, what do you mean by seven priorities? Are these the top things on the agenda for Burrell or is this something else? In, in a way, you did respond to that by saying that they should be on top of his agenda. But at the same time, there are also very big items which have been excluded from this list, which are naturally sitting uh, atop of the desk of any high representative. Uh, most notably, we have uh, Ukraine and Russia, the entire Sahel, which is becoming even more relevant than, than it was also with the mandate of uh, his uh, predecessor, Federica Mogherini. And of course, relationship with China, which do uh, hold a whole different set of implications for what the European is doing. And Brexit, I imagine. Well, yes, mm. Brexit, yes, but it's not one of the main competencies of mm-hmm. the high representative. So basically, it will, it will have to unfortunately cope with the severe consequences that Brexit will have in many cases internally and externally, but is not in a steering position to, to shape the outcomes of, of Brexit. The only exception being the kind of partnership, political uh, and security in particular, that the European Union and the United Kingdom will enjoy after Brexit uh, takes place. And before we get to the seven priorities themselves, can I ask you, Lisa, what my experience of previous high representatives, chief diplomats, they can never really break through on multiple fronts, that they should really focus on one thing, maybe like Catherine Ashton did with Kosovo and Serbia and the Iran deal. Uh, Do you think it would actually be wiser overall for Burrell just to focus on one thing? Before we get to the seven things that we've decided he should focus on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a very good point. I think it's definitely sure, uh, true that he should pick his battles. Um, he should really see where the EU can have um, added value in sort of dealing with the crisis in EU foreign policy. But at the same time, he, he, as the head of the EU diplomatic service, he will have to deal with a lot of other issues as well. So he needs to strike that balance of being present, being really the voice of the European Union in, in the world, but at the same time also making sure that he identifies those areas where the EU can have that specific added value in the work and where he really should put his diplomatic capital. And he can always also assign specific member states with specific tasks as well, uh, special representatives and so on. So he doesn't have to do the job on his own. So this is really a list of things that Crisis Group believes ought not fall off Burrell's agenda as he gets busy responding to his inbox. So these are the things that might show up in his inbox as surprises if he isn't proactive about them. Is that a good way to characterize it? Absolutely. (laughs) So let's let's talk about them very briefly. Uh, One of them is Ethiopia. Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about what Crisis Group thinks the EU should be doing in and about Ethiopia? Yes. So we chose Ethiopia to be on our list because it's coming into a very crucial stage this year specifically with elections in May this year. It's uh, it's a country which is going through deep changes with a new prime minister who is trying to reform the country and open it up to the world. At the same time, he has the prime minister Abiy has uh, struggled to really keep um, intercommunal tensions in check. And specifically in the run up to these elections that are upcoming, the threat of these violence increasing is, is very very high. So it's very important for the EU as a major donor and also very important diplomatic ties to Ethiopia to keep the country on their radar and specifically in the run up to these elections. And that will be for Burrell specifically, it will mean to really make sure that the diplomatic efforts and the development cooperation work hand in hand. Uh, because we have here the need for clear political messages to Abi and to the political leaders of the different groups on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's also a need for development from the EU side and specifically also electoral support um, to the institutions, but also for political dialogue between the different actors. And there the development service of the European Commission can play a role. So here, Josep Borrell should work very closely with his colleagues from the European Commission, making sure that this is on everybody's agenda and addressing the challenges ahead. Okay, thank you. So another uh, one of the countries on the list is Venezuela, uh, which I think would actually have a hard time falling off the list, perhaps. But Giuseppe, tell us a little bit about what you think the EU role specifically is in Venezuela. Yes, Venezuela will remain relevant also for the coming year in particular. And it's one case where Borrell has also 
uh, along personal experience as, as a Spanish uh, foreign minister. And basically, he should also resist all sirens to nuance his own uh, position and maintain the EU engaged uh, on Venezuela as much as possible. And that because the EU can be instrumental in fostering a diplomatic solution to the crisis, which is the only one which can take place now. Basically, at the end of the day, uh, the solution that we had recommended in different formats was to facilitate a negotiated solution leading to elections with the reform of all institutions that will be required for doing so, whereas the opposition has also to nuance uh, its own demands for the time of the exit of sin of Maduro. The European Union has been uh, very present despite an alternating alignment uh, in the early stages of the crisis uh, last January but the diplomatic initiative that they took with the international contact group, they still remain one of the viable players that shaped one of the viable formats that can help um, foster change there. Most importantly, the European Union has also a substantial financial support it can play in minimizing the regional impact of this crisis. Because with uh, more than uh, 4.5 million migrants and refugees in the region, with, with, with a very a harsh regional spillover, 1.6 being only in Colombia, the financial and technical support that the European Union can provide uh, is a necessary relief to Latin American countries. Okay, so staying in Latin America, Lisa, Bolivia. Yes, so we decided to put Bolivia also on our list, specifically because the EU has played a very important mediating role together with the Catholic Church and the UN Special Envoy after the resignation of Evo Morales, after contested elections, and when uh, protests were spreading in the streets and um, there was a violent crackdown on the protests, and the EU has been very active there specifically because many of the other external actors were seen as biased, whereas the EU was seen as a neutral actor that had the trust from all sides. So we've seen that there's an important role. And now that there is a process in place to go for a rerun of the elections, uh, there might be a need for further mediation from the European Union and other actors. And so we really wanted to make sure that this stays on the radar of Josep Borrell it is one of those countries that is not traditionally on the EU's high priority list, so it's very easy to fall off the radar. But it is one of those few cases where there's an added value for the European Union and uh, they can help in mediating towards the elections and as well help with election monitoring to make sure elections are transparent and to prevent that election results are contested again. But this is really fascinating mm. that Bolivia and Latin America as a whole seems so mm. far from the European Union. It's part of another great power's traditional sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. It's a, a long way away. How can the EU really be effective and, and listened to out there? So I think it's very important to see that the EU has been investing a lot in development projects and working with civil society, working with institutions, even in countries like that, that are not, it's not necessarily in the media and you wouldn't really know so much about the work that the EU would do in Latin America. But they are present um, through their delegation and also through the member states' embassies um, and have been engaging a lot with the political representatives in the country as well as with opposition. They know the country very well and they are not necessarily seen as having the same strong interests as some of their other external players, the other external partners of these countries. So they probably have gained a bit more trust um, and are seen as neutral and can therefore play a strong facilitating role in some of these areas. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we are talking with uh, Giuseppe Fama, the head of the Crisis Group EU Affairs Unit, and Lisa Muschel, the Senior Analyst for EU Advocacy and Research at Crisis Group, about priorities for the European Union's new chief diplomat, Giuseppe Borrell of Spain. So, Giuseppe, uh, Libya, also on the list. Yes, Libya is a case, well, it, it's a big puzzle, I would have to say, uh, now for Borrell at this stage, which is both an obvious one, but also a, a surprising country to name among those where they actually do need to redouble efforts. Libya is uh, at Europe's doorstep. There are very dense, strong and long-standing historical relationships across the Mediterranean, of course. Some countries are more involved than others, but unfortunately also for most of the crisis which is stretching currently in Libya. Some member states, in particular Italy and France, uh, have been supporting uh, opposite side um, of the conflict. 
this has produced a situation where other foreign stakeholders have seized opportunities to capitalize hands of presence. Uh, in the country, you have Russia, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and Egypt siding with, with Haftar in the east, while you have Turkey and Qatar being much more presence behind the uh, government of national uh, accord in the west. All in all, this situation has produced a very dangerous statement for the Libyan people, uh, where Haftar in particular, had thought to be very close to gain the military upper hand. So the inaction of Europe or the difficulty in, in fostering an effective and I would say also an ambitious plan to uh, engage in Libya basically made this conflict become uh, protracted and, and, and risk also prolonging even more. Now the situation is partly changing with Ankara stepping up its own engagement in the conflict, which will also risk uh, making the Libyan crisis become even more deadly than it was before. Borrell has a role to play in the sense that he has to refoster and capitalize on the recent show of unity in Europe, especially from, from France and Italy, put all of his weight behind diplomatic initiatives currently shepherded by Germany uh, to support the United Nations mediation process. And he also has an important role to play to launch some efforts that Federica Mogherini, unfortunately, uh, did not manage to accomplish, such as restoring the naval presence of the EU Naval Operation Sofia, which was an important deterrent force for the uh, circulation of weapons toward um, Libya in the high sea, and also saving lives uh, in the Mediterranean, and at the same time reestablish a meaningful presence of the European Union as soon as conditions will allow. So it is very much about unity, ambition, and ensuring that this remains an urgent file uh, that Borrell will prioritize during his own mandate. So no less urgent, uh, and I think probably already on his agenda, is Syria. Lisa, tell us what the EU should be doing in Syria that it's not doing already. <laughs> Yes, um, Syria will remain a big headache for uh, Josep Borrell because it's a country where the EU didn't have a lot of influence on the on the course of the conflict. But at the same time, it's also impossible for the EU to ignore um, Syria. And of course, we have a huge humanitarian fallout from the conflict that uh, that needs to be addressed. So Josep Borrell needs to recognize that Syria will probably not be stable during his mandate. So he should focus on alleviating the suffering of the Syrians outside Syria and also inside Syria as much as possible to at least retain a degree of stability in the region in that perspective. Specifically important will be to help the neighboring countries of Syria who have been very important in hosting Syrian refugees and all of them also have struggled with sort of their economic record and with hosting, uh, hosting many of these uh, refugees and it will be important for the EU to coordinate their support to the neighboring countries. At the same time, also, it will be important to for him to work with member states and find a way to see how to address Syria and specifically a contentious question of the reconstruction in Syria, where many member states have different views on how to go about this. Um, so for him, he will have an important role in trying to forge some sort of understanding on, on what to do and may, potentially finding ways to do small scale rehabilitation projects that don't cross any of the EU's red lines and are not cooperating with the Syrian regime, but still providing a very minimum of public services, which will be important to avoid the risk of conflict perpetuating in the country. And that will ease some yeah. of the humanitarian suffering Absolutely. as well. Sudan, Giuseppe. Yes, Sudan is another case that was key uh, for the European Union to follow also before Bashir's demise, but that will uh, remain essentially at the centre of the stage for the EU because of the still potential grave consequences that Sudanese transition holds. In particular, the transitional government of Prime Minister Hamdok estimated they will need about $10 billion uh, to support the uh, economic needs of the country uh, and also limiting the impact of some of the needed reforms to the population. Uh, and, and of course, the European Union holds uh, a significant financial capital that could be uh, very much instrumental in determining the success or failure of the Sudanese transition. Not European Union alone, of course, uh, they must play with partners because $10 billion U.S. dollars is something that needs to be pulled internationally. But this is where Borrell can play very much in coordination with other commissioners, especially the Commissioner for International Aid and Development, Jutta uh, Urpilainen, to remain very much seized of this matter 
and actively support this transition, which also means providing technical support to the transitional government and ensure that they can deliver and remain on hold because the transitional government itself has several elements of weaknesses. And a further uh, way Borrell can personally help push improve the situation in Sudan is to uh, press diplomatically the United States on the lifting of the state um, uh, of Sudan as a country listed in Mm -hmm. uh, state sponsors of terrorism, because that would prevent much of the financial flows that the country need, again, to refine its own uh, stability. So it is a different way of of, uh, seeing uh, Borrell's role there. Uh, It relies much more on on Europe's traditional financial power, but it's also one of the main tools that they have at their disposal, and it needs to make full use of that. Okay, last but not least, uh, and always exciting, Iran and the Gulf. Lisa, uh, talk to us about how the EU can make things better. Yes, definitely not least. It's um, definitely the first crisis that um, Josep Borrell has to deal with during his term, especially because uh, we're in a very dangerous escalatory cycle between in the when it comes to the tensions between the US and Iran. The EU has an interesting role to play in the sense that they are one of the actors that is talking to to all sides. Um, So have channels of communication to all sides as much as to the US government, as well as to Iran and other actors in the region. So they play an important role in passing messages and should try everything they can to escalate uh, tensions where possible and to get out of this escalatory cycle. De-escalate. De-escalate. (laughs) Sorry. Um, What would be specifically important for Borrell is to rally the EU member states, specifically also the E3 with Germany, France and the UK, who have been specifically important also when it comes to the Iran file and specifically to the nuclear deal, to make sure that they have a joint position and to respond coherently to this and... um, try to stay on the path of de-escalation rather than taking sides and feeding into some sort of escalatory narrative. So going back to something Hugh said earlier, this is sort of a broad but shallow agenda, right? There's a lot. This isn't about taking one thing and trying to fix it. It's about trying to do a little, often on the margins of a lot of things. What does that mean in terms of the trend for how EU foreign policy is evolving and some of these debates that Giuseppe mentioned about what the role of the European Union really is. Uh, Is this a big lift? Is it a small lift? Does it require institutional change to carry it out? Giuseppe? Yes, certainly. I would actually say it is is a mix of of the suggestions that you actually made uh, because some would uh, require very little to be done. I mean, the European Union already has a very wide toolbox that they can mobilize. Uh, Of course, it's very much dependent on the political convergence among member states and on the presence of the will, first of all, of the member states to back um, uh, these decisions. Others would require um, a few institutional improvements because there is also much to be done in terms of strengthening the European Union itself as as a foreign policy player. After all, we are just 10 years away from the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon, which is the the, the one that uh, shaped the current institutional setting, where you have an autonomous European Union uh, diplomatic service, this kind of configuration of coordination with the Commission, and this kind of coordination between the EU and its own member states. So it's a very young animal, a young beast in the making. Uh, And of course, there are many processes that are uh, to be improved. The diplomatic service is is, is less than, than 10 years old. They recently established a major directorate which is in charge of all conflict prevention, early warning, mediation and stabilization actions, which is starting to work more synergetically with the traditional pieces of due diplomacy, so the geographically shaped uh, units, let's say, internally. So they're learning of doing better as the situation evolves. Uh, at the same time, changes are maybe slower than the situation beyond the borders of Europe would require. And of course, this is one of the main uh, questions to address, the the pace and and how early is Europe actually prepared to react uh, when the situation requires it. If there are, let's say, four things that need to be uh, focal points as the EU prepares to handle these and all the other issues on its agenda, uh, what would they be, Lisa? So I'll start with two that Mm -hmm. I think are very important. On the one hand, from a crisis group perspective, it's very important to work on the early warning and to pay more attention to the early warning work because the EU is famous for 
basically reacting to crisis once they've already broken out and then scrambling to to keep a lid on things. Uh, so it would be very beneficial, actually, for Josep Borrell to, to put a, a, a stronger early warning focus on his foreign policy and also discuss early warning um, countries, so countries where that seem stable, but where we see clear risks of a, a potential escalation, put these on the agenda of the Foreign Affairs Council. So we discuss these with EU member states early, rather than late when the crisis has already broken out. Um, that's something where, where we see him really, he, he could really go a long way with taking that initiative. It's not easy because it's, of course, there's always other more important, very urgent things um, that foreign ministers need to deal with. But I think it would be a start to really focus on some countries where that seems stable, where the EU could potentially work on the prevention. And on the prevention side... I think it will be also about changing certain working modalities of the, how the EU and the, um, the member states work together. They have uh, working groups in which they discuss countries every week, but there is no focus in lo no group, no working group in which any form of prevention is really discussed very particularly. So I think there's a scope for really putting pre conflict prevention more, more up front, also in the discussions, the working group discussions among member states, making sure that uh, this is part of their discussion and of um, finding solutions for countries that are at risk of conflict. Thank you. Uh, Giuseppe, what would you add? Basically, echo uh, the point Elisa just made. This question of uh, uh, ensuring that conflict prevention is strongly present into the working arrangements of the Council is essential. There are too many others that I would add, but I'm thinking that we can also refer to the frustration that uh, Borrell himself had with the Council. There is a, a now infamous interview, I think, at the European Council for Foreign Relations, where he defined the Foreign Affairs Council as the Valley of Tears, where people <laughs> will just you know, go there and, and, and show their dismay with the situation in, in, in their countries and not do more. Most recently, he referred to the council as, I think, a travel agency where ministers mm. were just sharing their own plans of, of trips um, abroad and, and little micro uh, national initiatives here and there. Uh, so there is awareness that things have to change also uh, among member states in the council and in their relations with member states. One way Europeans are debating uh, to change things is to do a little revolution, which is introducing the qualified majority voting in the Council, in the Foreign Affairs Council. And that will be a big change uh, because basically foreign policy in the EU is one of, it is the main last intergovernmental domain remaining, you know, that doesn't make EU a you know, fully political union in a sense, to act autonomously. And so that will be a big change. Jean-Claude Juncker, the previous president of the European Commission, suggested three areas uh, where this should take place. Uh, there are human rights, sanctions, and agreeing European Union common security and defence missions. So small security and defence initiatives to take. I am told that Borrell himself is not necessarily enthusiastic about this idea. And I think that this debate has been moving on a, a little bit too lightheartedly. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been many examples where, when trying to recur or forcing also common positions, then member states who were not agreeing simply did not comply. We can think at many cases we had individual member states trying to veto common positions and statements, uh, take Hungary uh, on the Middle East, take most recently Poland also on, on, on climate goals for Europe. And in the past, Italy, before the change government, was even very much opposing, uh, reactivating some measures on Libya. And I'm not sure that then by forcing some common positions with a qualified majority, then the, their left hand, or maybe the right hand, would follow suit mm -hmm. uh, at the national level. So it is risky also to produce expectations around that. There, are, there is maybe a different way to work around this question, uh, and it's very much about how the high representative, how Joseph Borrell, has to engage member states and his fellow ministers. I was in the room... In the, in the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament five years ago, when Federica Mogherini gave her inauguration speech. And before the Parliament, uh, she said that the success of the European Union very much depends on her own capacity to shape buy-in and responsibility among member states. Five years later, you would say exactly the same words. Mm -hmm. and, and this is very much something that should be instead the priority of Borrell. We understand that, that he's close to this view, and there are very, very good practices that he shall build on. Most recently, 
the Finnish uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, in, in July travelled around the Gulf uh, to work around uh, the crisis in Sudan on behalf of the Europeans. Uh, in response to the Turkish growing involvement in Libya, he convened a group of uh, ministers from Europe to discuss internal solutions, and he also agreed to the E3 requests to anticipate a Foreign Affairs Council in response to the recent events between the Iran, uh, Iran and the US. So these are early signs that uh, certainly Joseph Borrell has, takes into account that this kind of views and wants to improve his own relationship with, with ministers, which is something that ultimately is very much necessary to uh, ensure that the EU mechanism to work externally is very much oiled up uh, and effective. So I think that is a excellent note for us to end on since we are out of time. But I think it will be fascinating to watch how Joseph Borrell, how his role as Europe's chief diplomat evolves over the course of his mandate uh, and how we at Crisis Group uh, continue to offer our own thoughts on how to make, uh, make the European Union more effective in preventing conflict around the world. And indeed, if I can say, soon we will have uh, the first watch list uh, that we issued tailored to the European Union, so the EU watch list for 2020, which will also propose recommendations for 10 cases where the European Union has a, an important role to play on emerging crises that will be as interesting as the past thread that we were discussing before. Fantastic. So read that. Uh, read the briefing that we've put together with the seven priorities. And keep listening to us here uh, at War and Peace. Uh, thank you, Giuseppe and Lisa, for joining us. Also, big thanks, as always, uh, to Miranda Sunnix, who gets us all uh, sorted at Crisis Group to make this possible, and our producer, Antoine LaRue and Bull Media. And thanks, as always, to our listeners. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.